Good afternoon and welcome to this latest webinar version of the implementation meetings for the assessment coordinators at each of the schools in the Madison Metropolitan School District. Um, because of our delay in snowy weather, we've had a chance to uh, have to re-record this. So this is going to be updated and posted on the website as soon as possible. But if you're viewing this, you already know that. A couple things before we get started, I wanna make sure that you know exactly where the resources are. So if you would uh, bear with me in a second, we'll share the screen and show you how to get a hold of the, the resources. Um, if you were to go to the district website, find the Office of Assessment Administration. And if you were to click on either elementary or middle school information, I'm just going to click on the elementary school. This shows you some of the basic information that we need for, or we'd like to have for our um, building coordinators, but it's open to everyone. So you can find on here the calendar of dates, also the latest planning and action calendars. Uh, down near the bottom, you'll see coordinator meetings. You click on January 2017 meeting, that will take you to the page with the information for this month. Schedule or agenda is right here. The agenda is corrected. The uh, next meetings will be February 15th, which is a Wednesday and the following Tuesday. So the dates are correct. The days of the week are just uh, switched around. But that this is a corrected agenda. You'll also find the PowerPoint that we're going to be using, and you will find uh, the planning calendars that I've uploaded for each of the elementary and middle school levels. Okay, so let's take a look at our um, uh, meeting for today. So we are going to uh, take a look at this. Again, our purpose is to make, uh, you don't have to sign in by the way, is to make sure that you understand that we all work together uh, better than separately. Uh, there's, this is a big job and I wanna just recognize that as, as I have before, but I, again, this season of assessment is getting uh, pretty intense and I know how much work it takes to get this done. So we need to support each other. So please don't hesitate to ask questions of, of Sarah or myself or each other in order to get information. The agenda today that we're gonna cover, we're gonna finalize some of the information for access for L's assessment. We're going to talk about the climate survey briefly. We'll spend the majority of the time taking a look at the Wisconsin Forward exam. We'll take a look at some information on the dynamic learning maps that you will need to, uh, you don't need to do anything, but it, most people would like to know what's going on in their buildings. And finally, if there are any lingering questions, just to make sure that you know how to get a hold of us. Okay, the uh, update for the access uh, for information, all printed materials, all printed materials need to be returned to Flom Road um, by February 8th. There's an email that went out to all access coordinators on January 20th that have all the details in it. If it's a printed material, including kindergarten um, kits, all those materials should be returned um, to uh, Sarah Walner uh, at Flum Road by the 8th of February. Um, you can consolidate boxes. If you have six boxes and you can fit it into two, please do that. We don't need any extra boxes sitting around. Um, there are plenty of yellow boxes here at Doyle. We don't need any more. Finally, uh, for access, the, one of the last things we'll need to do is make sure that we have accounted for all the students that we're expected to test. This means that if students were not able to test, for whatever reason, we need to record that. So there are four different reasons why you could uh, you, you would not be taking the uh, access test. Number one is uh, absence. So that could be anything from I'm in the hospital, uh, I have a student who left the country and is just getting back now, uh, in and out, they've been absent on the days that, that you are testing. Uh, it's a attendance issue. If they were absent, that is what you need to record. Um, a second piece, if the, they have, um, have cheated, 
if they were using an electronic dictionary to help translate things, for instance, and uh, that makes the test invalid, we need to know that. So the second choice is an invalidation of the test. The third option is one that is not used very often at all, and that's special education deferred. Uh, in fact, we don't know of any single student in the entire district that would uh, fit into that particular category. If you think there's a reason why they did not take the alternative assessment, the alternate access, um, if for some reason the IEP is unclear, please let us know and we'll work with student services to get clear answers on that. The fourth and final reason why a student would not take this is called, uh, what is it called? It's not an opt out. It is declined. Parents, families, students can decline taking the test. There is no opt out of this. We allow parents and families to tell us that they want to opt out, but ultimately um, it is a, the fact that the students have declined to test. Now, what do you do with this information? Please email that to either Sarah Walner or myself and make sure that um, we get that information and respond to it. We'll be putting that into the software. Um, I will be either on the 27th of January or on the 30th on Monday, I'll be sending every building a list of who has not completed access. This is not a shame on you email. This is just, here's what our records show. What do you think? What are, do you have plans? Is this person a no-show, et cetera? So I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're working together on this. If you have more questions about the access assessment, um, any of the issues, I know that you've been uh, uh, connecting with us. I, we appreciate that. I uh, want to make sure things are clear. So please let us know if you have any questions. All right, now let's move on to the climate survey. Climate survey for students is going to be for students in grades 3 through 12. The expectation is that all students will take the, uh, the climate survey. The window for the survey is Monday, February 6th through Friday, February 24th this year. The entire climate survey has been rewritten. Um, the topics are the same, but the questions have been rewritten with support of staff, uh, feedback from staff and teachers and parents um, so that the questions themselves appear to be um, uh, much more student friendly. We have a new vendor for the survey. So there will be a link that will be provided uh, for students, it will not be an email. Uh, they simply need to click on the link and it will be available, the survey will be available to them to begin. Now, I'll show you the uh, beginning of the survey in just a moment, but please note, students will need to have their MMSD ID in order to start the survey. This always brings up the question, well, it doesn't seem to be very confidential if you have my ID number. The fact is we don't look at any names. The only thing that it's used for is to collect information on demographics. So it really, uh, I've seen the reports, there's no, there are no names that are pulled at all. It's just simply demographics. The final two bullet points have actually changed in the last 48 hours since, since uh, we actually uh, have, have put this um, PowerPoint together. And so students will be able to self-select which language they want, English, Spanish, or Hmong. So this is a little bit incorrect. So let's take a look at what it looks like when you begin the student survey. Students will be sent, you will be given a link uh, to this, and you will have a login process for Windows machines. Chromebooks will be a different process. Uh, currently, we're looking at going through the uh, um, the library portal, I think it's called the LibGuide. We'll make sure that, that we'll get that information out to you shortly. But the most, the most important thing is, here is what the first page looks like. You can see here is where students enter their ID number, and then there is a drop-down window for them to select English, Spanish, or Hmong. We are working on other languages to add to this. Um, all of it connects to the exact same questions in the same order, the data goes to the same place, Students have the ability to flip back and forth between languages. 
So if an, a native Spanish speaker who is, uh, let's say, at DPI level four wants to attempt the survey uh, in English, they feel more comfortable trying that, but then suddenly realize that they don't exactly know what is being asked, they can switch back to Spanish and it will um, not lose their answers. It will just continue uh, collecting that information. So we'll be getting the login process to everyone on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, letter availability um, is being finalized right now. I know that I said I would get that out to you on the January 23rd and I get it to go home today, but it looks like it's going to be next week. I apologize, but uh, we're trying to get this all done. All right, here's the big piece. Wisconsin Forward Exam. Now, our window is March 20th through April 28th this year. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about scheduling and what that window means. Essentially, the process is very similar to last year. Uh, there are not many changes to the assessment itself, except that it is actually a more stable um, than last year. Last year was pretty good. So the test is improved, the software is improved, but here's the thing I want you and everyone to remember. Here are the subtests. English language arts does have three sections to it. So those three sections make up English, English language arts. Mathematics has two sections or subtests that make up the mathematics portion. This is for every student in grades three, five, six, and seven. Now grades four and eight have both ELA and math, but they also have additional assessments, science, which is two sessions, and social studies, which is also two sessions. Combined, the uh, first two take approximately four hours to assess, and the total time for grades four and eight is approximately seven hours. As we're well aware, this is a huge amount of time for assessment, so you really need to be thinking about how we're going to schedule and how to make this uh, as approachable for students and staff and, and instruction, all of that uh, as approachable as possible. Now, one of the big things that we're faced with is we need to make sure that we get uh, the right uh, supports for students in place in a timely manner. So here we're going to start reviewing some of this. Please note that this, these are the same types of supports or accommodations as we had last year. Universal supports are for all students. These are things such as highlighters, electronic highlighters, uh, magnification, uh, line readers, things that allow students to to access the information that's written on the screen in a way that allows them to um, focus on understanding what the question is asking versus struggling with the language, how to read it, etc. So it's not so much a test of, of reading as it is a test of the content area. The second type are designated supports. And these, as we you might recall, are for uh, available to all students, but are for students, some students with particular reason for having them. This could be stacked translations, it could be text to speech. We'll take a look closer or closely at these in a few minutes. Finally, the third type of support for students are accommodations. These are only for, only allowed for students who have specific uh, call outs in their IEP or 504 plans for these particular types of accommodations. We're going to take a look at specifically supports for English language learners, as well as our ever popular and uh, nebulous struggling readers category. All right, let's take a, look, a little closer look at more of these supports. For students with IEPs who need accommodations, these will need to be in OASIS by February 10th. I know that's early, that's coming up quickly, but uh, if these accommodations are in place on February 10th, that allows us the time to input this on the backside of the uh, eDirect software that controls the testing for all students. We're assuring that each student will get this, um, uh, these accommodations in place and connected with their tickets for testing. Now, we also realize that um, IEPs are open. Um, they may be changed after February 10th but it takes a, a, quite a bit of time once students are placed in sessions to pull them out, change the accommodations and supports, 
put them back into sessions, print and regenerate it and print a new ticket. Um, it takes a long time for that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're as, as efficient as possible. And if you can talk to, with your staff and let them know that February 10th is when we're pulling data, we appreciate as much current information as possible, but we also understand that things change. So, all right, supports for ELLs. Uh, last year, we tried a, something um, that we're going to, again, hopefully we're revising it, and I want to make sure that you uh, get a chance to see this. So you're going to receive a list on or before January 20th. Let me take a look and see what that looks like. You're going to get a list of all students in your building who are listed as English language learners. And that list will be, this happens to be an Excel spreadsheet, but you will receive it as a Google Doc. Now on this, it says that this is for marking the, the uh, designated supports that go along with students who are English language learners. If you need information about what those are, there is a link that will be on the page that will take you to the DPI's accessibility guide and just review that. Information can be found on pages eight through 12 of that particular guide. So you notice that we have listed here several students. They are ELLs, here's the program type. The other type of program could say DLI, for dual language uh, immersion programming. So this has, is the home language, the, the English language proficiency level, their DPI level. Now over to the right in this area that is shaded blue are the most common designated supports for students who are uh, English language learners. First one is text masking. That will allow them to cover the text except for a specific portion, so it blocks out all extraneous information. Next one, text to speech. So there's a computer voice that will read the text um, oh, it's on the screen to the student. Um, it doesn't typically, in the past, it did not read a single word, it will read a sentence. Stack translations. This is Spanish language over the top of English language on the screen. So you will find that you cannot, we cannot do stack translations and text-to-speech. As the voice for text-to-speech reads only English, it applies English uh, phonetic uh, rules to the Spanish and it is actually horrendous what happens then. So it's either or, one or the other. So if a student is stronger in reading, Spanish and making a, a inference from that, you would want to use stack translation. The student is better at uh, oral and, and listening, um, maybe you would want to use text to speech. So put an X in the box, whichever it is. Another uh, designated support is a bilingual word for word dictionary. It is not a dictionary that defines words. It is a word for word, so directly taking the the English word and translating it into the second language. So that must be provided by the schools. Here's where it gets kind of tricky. Um, I would not apply this to, to what um, students are using unless they use it regularly in classroom instruction. Stack translations and text-to-speech are mimic what, we, what I consider to be uh, typical classroom situations, text-to-speech, uh, where a teacher would might read something in English so that the student can hear it. Stack translations would mean providing translated, translated materials in the classroom. However, if you do not use a bilingual dictionary, uh, this must be paper, it cannot be electronic dictionary. Uh, don't suddenly start to use it on the test. You'll also know that note that there are other um, designated supports which do not require things like a, a change in the computer settings. However, we do need to know these. So here's an example. Are the students going to be in a separate setting? We do put that into the computer and that is shared with the vendor uh, if there's any scoring questions, etc. But we need to have this information. It does not, however, change the nature of the assessment. Here's another example, noise buffer. So if it's important that the student is uh, as needs to have the surrounding noise blacked out. Um, this would be something that you could put on. Again, um, it, this is uh, for local 
providing this, your school needs to provide this for the students. All right. You'll also note that on the bottom of this, the uh, school uh, building added these two people as struggling readers. We will not include any struggling readers on your list. If you have some, uh, please add them to this list so we can upload these into the software. You'll notice that these uh, particular struggling readers are also going to be using text-to-speech. The other uh, option is read aloud, and we'll talk about that in a little, bit, a little bit. So you should be getting this on Monday the 30th. Uh, we do need to have this back in a timely fashion. So uh, this is a very busy season for us in the assessment office, as we have um, assessments at all levels going on. Uh, beginning at the high school level, we have the ACT, Work Keys, uh, we have MAP, PALS, Dynamic Learning Maps, uh, Aspire, uh, Forward, I think that's about it. Oh, Climate Survey, which we'll get to, uh, which we've already talked about. So that's a lot going on. I understand that, that um, that's a, a burden at the building level, but I also want to make sure that you... Uh, understand that we need to make sure that we get all this done. So it's sometimes hard to get the questions answered in as timely a fashion as we like. Please, this is a begging you forgiveness as we go forward uh, kind of plea. So if we're not right there and getting back to you, we try very hard, but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. All right, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, we're going to jump in, all right. Here we go. Uh, sorry. All right. So you'll receive that list of English language learners no later than the 30th of January. It will contain a list of English language learners in your building as of the date in which the data was pulled, either the 27th or the 30th. Any new students, any new English language learners that enroll after that date, you will need to add to the list. Otherwise, they will not be included in what designated supports they can get. That list, that sheet, that Google sheet that you'll be getting needs to be returned to OAA by the 17th, end of the day on the February 17th. This actually just gives us three calendar days uh, to begin the work of uploading this into uh, eDirect. Turns out the 17th is in fact a Friday, we're not going to be working over the weekend to put this into eDirect. So Monday morning, we're going to hit it hard. We cannot have late um, uh, documents turned into us because it just really is going to slow us down and we need to get this done so that we can get other information out to you as quickly as possible. Now, again, let's just review this. Supports for English language learners. We have stack translations and text-to-speech. These cannot be given to, um, together. It's one or the other. These are, in fact, the two most common types of designated supports that are were given to our students uh, who are English language learners. Text-to-speech, once again, or read aloud. These are the two most common um, supports given for, suggested for struggling readers. It's an either or. Let me tell you right now that read aloud requires more work at the building level than does text to speech. Read aloud requires uh, additional professional development for the person, as well as the signing of a security agreement, and you cannot test large groups of students. Uh, text to speech, you simply need to provide um, headphones and you should be all set. So please consider carefully. We are not going to disallow either one of them. Um, if you put down both text-to-speech and read aloud, we will automatically default to text-to-speech. Okay, now here comes the, the difficult part about scheduling. Here is the next couple months coming up. Forward exam window statewide opens on the 20th of March. We have a religious holiday that is observed in MMSD on the 21st. No assessment can take place on the 21st of March. You have the rest of that week, you have the following week in March, April, beginning the 3rd through the 7th, you also have uh, for assessment. 
However, please know, and I'm sure you already know this, that April 10th, this week, is spring break. Upon return from spring break, uh, the 17th through the 28th are the remainder time, remaining time for the windows. Please, please seriously consider trying to get the lion's share of your assessment done in this week, the 20th of March, the 27th of March, and the early part of this week prior to uh, spring break. Yes, of course, you can use all this time, but I would hate for you to suddenly uh, start testing on the 17th or 18th um, and then a disruption occur um, and you not be able to finish. These tests do uh, count for accountability purposes, and so we really want to make every effort to get all students assessed during this window. I also know that beginning May 1st, which is right here, is when the spring map window opens. So keep that in mind as you move forward and schedule your assessment, who, which grades are being scheduled for uh, which date. Uh, fourth and eighth grade have the longest, uh, greatest amount of assessments. So if you were to start them first and then move into third and, and sixth and seventh or fifth, however that works for your building, that's fine. But please don't schedule a grade level for this last week of April and then schedule the same group to be testing this first week in May for MAP. Uh, student exhaustion, uh, it just, it's, it's not good. It's not good. We don't get good test results. Um, and we want to make sure that students are able to are be refreshed enough to show us how well they, they, they know things. All right, let's uh, finish up the forward exam updates. DPI and the uh, Data Recognition Corporation, the, the forward exam vendor, are going to be providing current information, new information, um, the week of January 30th through the 3rd of February. So we'll be providing you updates as well as we get things uh, more becomes known and we get things posted to our website. If you have questions about this, please don't hesitate to email myself or Sarah Walner. All right, this, now you can take a deep breath. This is the uh, dynamic learning maps update. And for most building assessment coordinators, you just need to know that this is happening in your building. It is not a requirement that you are involved in this. As of last January, and uh, actually December and January, um, the, our office and student services uh, pulled a list of students who qualify for the dynamic learning maps as the alternate assessment. Um, the PSTs and CC teachers and case managers were involved in this. Uh, they know who their students are and they are currently in the professional development phase of learning how to give the dynamic learning maps. The next step of this is they, those case managers, those PSTs, CC teachers will uh, fill in, fill out a document called First Contact and PNP. We then input that into the software and uh, then that allows the assessment to actually get ready to begin. The DLM testing window opens on March 20th. Now keep in mind that this is going to be for grades three through 11. So there's a, um, a big investment in time and energy uh, across the district on this particular assessment. So you understand the nature of this assessment. Each of the students in the content area will get a small, what's called a testlet three to five questions, maybe six questions, which they will respond to on a daily basis. So day one, they would get um, English language arts uh, testlet. They would also get a math testlet. Uh, the uh, person who is administering the test gives those questions to the student. They, they answer and then they are done for the day. That generates another set of questions, another three to six questions, um, the following day that are that are sent to them. So again, the following day, they have to log in and answer those questions. This continues for anywhere from a week to two weeks, depending on the content area. So really, um, this is a fairly time-consuming um, assessment. We're well aware of that, and we want to support teachers um, in, in what they're doing. Uh, please uh, 
don't make light of DLM as it is a very major time uh, commitment. All right. If you have any lingering questions, if there are things that I've said that uh, you may um, wonder about, um, please let me know. Uh, last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share with you um, some of the latest dates uh, regarding um, assessment information. So I'm going to go to our website once again, and we're going to um, No, I guess I'm not going to go to our website. Hang on. Okay, so on the January 2017 meeting information page, if you were to click on uh, either one of these uh, calendars, this is the action or planning calendar that we have uh, been using all year. Uh, please note that uh, we have a new date on the bottom of this. This is revised as of January 24th. We are um, also, we've added several new dates on February, and this will be, again, brought up to date after the DPI meeting. But uh, the 15th is an implementation meeting on the east side, webinar version on the 21st, uh, professional development for EPLM must be completed. Please note, on March 13th, we will be printing uh, the forward test tickets and getting them to you. Uh, the window opens one week later. DLM window also opens that same week. So we're trying to get this to you as quickly as possible. The, uh, that's why we need to have your cooperation in getting all the information back on the 17th so that we can do this work because each student was either an English language learner or has an IEP. Each record needs to be touched one by one in order to get this completed. We will be printing tickets out in uh, separate colors for each content area and sending those to you um, shortly or sometime around the 13th so that you can get busy um, separating those. Uh, as far as I know, nothing has changed as far as how they will be ordered. Uh, we'll find out more from DPI. Okay, um, again, if there are any questions, please let me know and we'll continue to uh, be in contact with you. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. It's, it is greatly appreciated and uh, we'll see you next time.